I'm interviewing Darlene Nokunla from Ekal Music Society. Uh, Darlene, the first question I'm going to ask you is to describe your program. Um, I've lived and worked in, in Baffin Island for 32 years now and, and uh, as an educator and I just recently retired but my passion is music education and uh, when I was a child going to school in Halifax we had a wonderful public music education program at that time and that was one of the things I noticed lacking in the school system here in Nunavut um, that the children who are very artistic and musically inclined there was no opportunity for music lessons so I started uh, in Kimmerud and I did a lot of singing with my kids there because um, I was their first English speaking teacher and I found music was a, just a natural way to learn language. And then when I came to a Calit, um, there was interest in learning to play the violin. And so uh, in 1995, the fiddle club started and it started as an after school program at Domi School because that's where I was teaching at the time. And then more and more parents from other schools wanted it, uh, the same opportunity for their ch children and then out of that, a couple of parents and a community member, uh, we, we were just having breakfast together one, and we said, wouldn't it be great if there was a summer music camp? And so out of that grew the summer music camp in 1996. And uh, then the Calvert Music Society grew from that because to get funding, the first year we had no funding to run the music camp, so it was purely volunteer. We had 40 students. But to get funding, we had to become a not-for-profit. So we, we became the, the Calvert Music Society. And so 23 years later, um, we've been going strong. We have uh, the annual summer music camp. We have now, in addition to the Calvert Fiddlers, we have an accordion club. And that's kind of beautiful because it's run by a former fiddler student of mine. And now she's taken up the accordion and she helps to co-lead uh, the summer music camp. And, uh, and we started the uh, choral festival or, or supporting volunteer teachers in the various schools maybe about 10 years ago. We've been doing the spring music festival and then the Christmas concerts as a way to get more kids involved throughout the school year. That was a long answer to that, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, in this program, what, who are your target audiences, like what age group, or like, um, is there a specific target for children, adults? Um, because most of us are working in schools, it's, it's uh, six, uh, six years old and up, but there's no upper limit. So we have adults, so if you were to come to one of our Saturday afternoon sessions, there's parents of children that are learning to play the violin or the accordion, and they're learning alongside their, and there's also a couple of adults that have no children in the program, but uh, I think it's good for the kids to see adults learning, mm -hmm. and for adults to see kids learning, and then for our summer music camp, um, the bulk of our kids there are six to I would say about 10, 11 years old. And so to keep some of the teenagers keen, we hire them as uh, recreation leaders or junior instructors. So they get to improve their music skills and their leadership skills. And we give them some training in that. And then they've gone on to become instructors. Several people uh, are instructors or coordinators of the program now. And my goal, our goal is to uh, pass it on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the aim of this program is to improve their um, like singing or like their language. What is your like main aim or purpose for this program? Um, music education in general but also uh, out of music education comes so many 
um, leadership opportunities too. If you can perform your instrument or you can sing a song in front of people, then you can be a leader. You can talk in front of groups. You can <laughs> motivate people because if you don't sing with passion, people aren't going to listen to you. But if you learn to emote, then people will and they can do it in your leadership or in the way you carry out other things in your life. Um, we do try and we wish we had way more resource people, but um, at our summer music camp, there's 10 workshops. So throat singing, drum dancing, accordion, fiddle, um, in up to two songs, traditional songs we teach that, and choral music. and. Uh, so like at, at the high school, the Talent Music Society was instrumental in getting a, a music teacher back. Mary focuses a lot in her choir on traditional Inuit songs. And so in the fiddle group too, um, we take the, the dance tunes of the various community, Pang, Samini Kanena, we, we play his songs on the violin and on the accordions, dance tunes from his Lulik. And the kids are interested in that, or if like a Pond Inlet tune. We've got kids that are from Pondit. Oh, I remember that tune. You know, so it, it helps them to learn the tune, and then they can see it if they can play it uh, for their grandparents. And, and uh, one time my fiddlers were playing on CBC radio, and, and Rosie Simonfeld, they said, you play that just like the accordion dance tune. And then the kids felt proud because, you, I mean, there's a way to play it like a fiddle tune, but then there's a different way to play it like a dance tune or an accordion dance tune that is popular here. So we try to bring the music up here of the Inuit into it and, and uh, it doesn't matter if the child's Inuk or not, they all seem to enjoy it because this is where they're at. So why not do the music of where they're at? They're also interested in classical music. So we do bring in some some like Western classical um, but it's of equal importance or the Inuit traditional music is of equal importance or more to our kids than, than the other, but it's good to expose them to different. Like when, uh, last week, when the ensemble Made in Canada, four Asian women from Toronto came, and they played Muscles in the Corner, a dance tune, with us at the, at the yeah. cathedral. And so then it's good for the kids to hear that. Mm -hmm. And is there a lot of interest, like is, um, are there a lot of applicants Well, our music camp is up to 150 kids, and that's pretty much capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough money, or we don't have enough money to hire more teachers. Mm -hmm. So you get kind of too big. And the fiddle club is the same, and the accordion club. I mean, the fiddle, we, the fiddle club has lots of instruments, so it's not the instruments. But then when class size gets too big, um, but we don't have, uh, like, jurisdictions across Canada, we have... Uh, a music program in a college or in a university where you can draw from their students to teach or no, or a city orchestra or a provincial orchestra. We don't have those kind of resource people so we're dependent on, I mean every year after music camp people crave guitar instructors but I can't find someone willing to volunteer their time week after week after week to teach. So there's a couple people in town that teach private lessons but not everyone can afford to pay 30 to 40 dollars an hour for a lesson. Whereas uh, for 23 years we've been providing the fiddle lessons for free. And uh, I mean, I have the means to volunteer and I've been thinking of uh, like how do we support more? Because it's not really, if you're a private music teacher, you're not really making tons of money. But you need to live, you know, and so that's one of my fears that if, if I retire from my passion, then who's going to carry it on, but right now there's a couple of people that are interested, but, so we have about, uh, I would say, 50 students in the fiddle club right now, mm -hmm. in three classes, and the classes are broad, it would be better if I could offer a couple more so that we could have more homogeneous groups, but because I'm a teacher and I know how to differentiate, <laughs> yeah. we can do that. Yeah. And, um, how do you measure like the success of this program? Like, um, 
do you see different like do you see differences in children like um, at the end of the program? Um, I see it in their faces when they they get it because violin is not an easy instrument to play, and the accordion. Uh, it's not. It's kind of unwieldy too for the little ones. But when they can play a tune and they're proud and they want to learn another tune, that's immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. um, when parents now plan their summer vacation around the music camp, and so when I was asked like two months before summer to change my week, I said by the DEI, I said I can because parents have planned to come back this week, not the week before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so because we've always had it the third week of August. So now parents plan. And then kids say, I wish music camp could go all year. Or parents say, can there be a winter music camp? <laughs> you know, like, so those are signs of, and when they come back year after year, and, or kids, you know, ask the day before camp, can I volunteer? You know, sure, you can volunteer. You can just come. <laughs> just, you know. And um, in this program, what challenges have you faced and how have you over overcome them to make this program successful? That's the success that it is. Um, th in this community, I'm overwhelmed by the, su the support of parents and community members. I mean, there are several businesses in town. Like if I have, I'm running an exchange, a music exchange with a group from South, they come to visit here, and, or I'm running a, a weekend workshop. Um, I can get food easily. Like, and, uh, and year after year, like our music camp is the only one that costs us a lot of money. Like one week of music camp for 150 people is $70,000 that I need cash to pay the visiting instructors. And uh, and when you think about it, because at one point somebody said to me, you know, hockey camp, um, they get their teachers for free. And I said, the salary of a hockey player versus a salary of a music educator. And uh, um, my husband's an artist and he used to teach drum dancing at music camp. but one piece of jewelry he can get $250 for. And we only pay our teachers $250 a day for camp. And that's a small contract. So I find it hard to get professional Inuit music educators because they can perform for five minutes and get $500. So working with kids all day. So unfortunately for drum dance, although last year I did have an artist teaching drum dancing, but for throat singing for many years now I've had to high school or young adult, Inuit adults. Um, and they do, in my mind, just as good a job as a professional because they know how to break it down. They just learned it recently. So, um, so that's a challenge because if I'm hiring a professional violin educator, I want to be able to hire a professional but in the way I, I, I'm helping those younger Inuit to get into professional jobs themselves. So in a way it's a step up. But, but if somebody could judge me on that, but might not be aware of the, the, the challenge to get someone and the challenge to get funding, because in Nunavut we have no multi-year funding. Uh, I have a colleague in New Brunswick who gets a quarter million dollar commitment from the New Brunswick government for four years. So he doesn't have to worry about money every year to run his program. Yeah. Whereas every year I have to write proposals and write reports. So that's the hardest part. Yeah. Not the actual program, it's just getting the funding. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, from your perspective, what is Inuit education? Well, I mean, last year I won the Inspire Partner in Indigenous Education Award. And when I got called, I said, 
I'm not Indigenous, I'm married to an Indigenous man. But they said, no, this award is for a non-Indigenous educator who, who helps and, uh, Indigenous students to move forward. So Inuit education means it has to be focused on the Inuit way of being, knowing, and doing. And so even though I'm teaching English here at Arctic College right now, I still focus on IQ principles. We started every week doing an IQ principles, and that leads our discussion and our writing. And then now I'm into value, so today's was perseverance. And uh, we started off by talking, what does that mean traditionally, and what does it mean now? And so the same thing when I work with Inuit children, or, or children in Nunavut, the class could be mixed culture, but because we're in Nunavut, Inuit land, then we focus on the perspective of Inuit. And, and because Inuit are open and welcoming, I, it's not that I don't recognize a little Filipino child in my class or an Italian kid. Like we, we celebrate their culture too, but because we're on Inuit land, we celebrate and recognize Inuit ways of being and knowing first. And then see how it works in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the third question I'm going to ask you is um, in this program, the Academic Music Society, um, what is your vision for the next, like, in the next 10 years? Like, what, what is your vision for? education over the next 10 years? Like, what improvements would you want to see in the future? I would like to see the arts a strong component of every school program. Um, I would like to see us not being just focused on the Calvary and over the years, we, we haven't been just a cow. Like two summers ago, we had the Pang Fiddlers come down to our camp. And I would like to broaden it. And next year, we're looking at bringing in some, because on, on Baffin Island alone, there's five communities that have fiddle programs now. So bringing in some musicians, from, older musicians, having them work at our camp as junior instructors, and then go back with a professional music educator that's already here and lead a workshop in their community. So we expand out more. Uh, one of my colleagues about five years ago, we did, we planned the first Kikitani, uh, Kathy Lee from Pang, she's the high, uh, co-principal in Pang, a Kikitani music and dance summit. And that was amazing because we had kids from five different communities, fiddlers, dancers, guitar players, accordion players, singers, that came together. And in my, at that point, it was 25 years, of teaching, that was the first time there was an inter-music exchange. There's sports exchanges, but kids connect in a different way through the arts. And uh, I had two white kids that went to Pang, and they were afraid. But after Pang, we did we did an exchange with Ottawa. We did an exchange with Halifax, and they kept saying to me, "Let's go back to Pang," because <laughs> they that made. And last year, um, one way I travel, and I think a lot of teachers in the North, if they want to expose their kids to the world, is with uh, Experiences Canada or YMCA Youth Exchange, because they pay the airfare. All you have to do is fundraise to host. And last year, um, Kathy Lee and I were thinking about a way to get us together again. So we put in an application to do an exchange, and uh, what Experiences Canada said to me, if a child can only go on one exchange, is going to Pangerton their best option when they could go anywhere else in Canada? And I said, you're, you're uh, believing that it's more beneficial to go south than to go north. And they said, you're right. And so they okayed it. But then uh, we had to postpone it because Kathy's mother got sick. Okay. But, but uh, I thought, because that's a perception out there that it's better to go south than 
to explore communities in your own region. Mm -hmm. So have you done that? Or is I'm that hoping, we're hoping to plan it again. Um, okay. Yeah. So you're planning on Yeah, we just postponed it for a year. Yeah. yeah. So do you know, like, how many kids would be, or have you talked or discussed, like, how many kids would go on that exchange, or like... Usually for those kind of exchanges, you can have groups of 10 to 30. But they have to be within the ages of 12 and 17, 12 and 18. So, so it depends on how many teens you have. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you would like to add? Let's see here. Um, well, I know firsthand from many anecdotal stories being able to play an instrument, being able to play the violin has saved lives. I also know that um, that I wouldn't have learned as a classroom teacher, but I've learned from teaching violin for the past 23 years and leading school choirs too, that, um, and I don't, I don't uh, audition, like there's groups down south where you have to be at a certain level to be in. So anybody that wants to come, we let come. And uh, even one year, uh, our precision percussion teacher, there was a kid with cerebral palsy. And at the final concert, music camp concert, they were doing their kind of like military drum routine. And so the, the percussion teacher gave the, the little boy with cerebral palsy a pillow so that his beat wouldn't interfere with the beat mm -hmm. of the others. But he was spot on at the concert. And then the percussion teacher, who was from Toronto, he said, I learned a lesson from you. Because I told him I wouldn't give him a pillow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to us whether he's off beat, as mm -hmm. long as it, he's up on the stage and he's proud as can be that he's doing it, right? And he said, I learned a lesson because he was spot on. He wouldn't have messed up in my mind. And... Uh, I've seen fiddle players that have gone on trips with me that at the time, like 12 years ago, I thought they couldn't play the pieces. Now when we get together, <laughs> they, they laugh at me because I forget the tunes and they know them. They can play them without the music. So, uh, and then a couple of people have said that, that uh, when a friend has committed suicide, they take out their violin or they take out their guitar. And so I think we need more arts. We need that's a big plug. More arts. Yeah. Okay. Time up. <laughs>